it's enormous controversy, very dividing actually amongst golfers is that the PGA Tour was really the only game in town at the highest level. And uh, yeah, the Live Golf Tour, which is, uh, I, I don't know a lot about it to be able, to be honest with you, but uh, it's, it's Saudi back dollars. I know Greg Norman was kind of the, uh, the uh, front runner name for it. I, I believe he's like the commissioner or the, you know, the manager of the tour. I'm not too sure how they do it. And they, they really did go out and recruit, uh, actively recruit PGA Tour players. And, uh, you know, it took a lot of, what they did, uh, they basically had a little bit different format. Um, uh, PGA Tour was always had little criticisms. There was always, you had to be formal. It had to be long pants. And the Live Tour, it's a little more casual. It's in shorts. Uh, it's, it's a three-day event instead of four-day events, which it is on the PJ Tour. There's an enormous amount of money um, that they paid the players just to come across, especially the, you know, the, the higher docket kind of players. And it caused a lot of controversy, uh, and a lot of people saw that as a way, a lot of the players saw it as a way to really solidify their future financially, certainly, but it comes with the controversy of, uh, of the Saudi money backing it. So there's, there's a lot of details. I know that there, there's, I believe they're in the process of bringing the tours together and there's a lot of controversy about that. Hello, I'm John Brink and we are podcasting on the brink from downtown Prince George, British Columbia. And for all those people that are watching us from around the world, Prince George, is in the province of British Columbia. It's part of Canada. It's an absolutely beautiful province. And obviously we're podcasting people from all around the world. Today we have a very special guest, also from British Columbia. His name is Dr. Terry Zachary. Zachary. You mind if I call you Terry, uh, uh, Terry? Terry is perfect, John, yes. So welcome to our podcast and Terry has a very, very interesting bio and, and especially relating to sports, hockey, golf, and he has done a lot of stuff and is doing a lot of interesting stuff in regards to hand strength and issues surrounding that and the importance of that. Terry, tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you're in British Columbia. I believe you're in Langley just uh, close to Vancouver. Tell us a little bit about where you're from and then your background and then what you're doing today. Yeah, well, John, thanks for the intro. and Thanks for having me. Uh, so a little bit of my background. Yeah, we're, uh, we're in Langley, British Columbia, a suburb of Vancouver. Um, our warehouse for our business is actually across the line in Blaine, Washington. Uh, so we are a worldwide business now. Uh, my background, as you, uh, as you alluded to, is in sports. I was a bit of a sports junkie growing up. Uh, being Canadian myself, uh, we started, you know, my, my first love was hockey. Uh, grew up playing hockey. Then I got interested in golf and basketball. And, and John, I would say kind of, you know, golf won out. I was really curious about details. And I don't know if that attracted me to golf or if, or if golf attracted me to details. But I ended up... Um, Playing, I was a pretty high-level college golfer. I won a lot of a uh, lot of tournaments in in college. And when it was kind of time to graduate, I I'm a sports chiropractor by profession. So I think even I think even golf and the details of golf got me interested in how the body works and how it moves, and and therefore it was a pretty natural progression. Exactly. Um, then there came a time in my life where uh, I was actually in practice and I thought, you know, golf doesn't go on or sorry, life doesn't go on forever. My, my dad had actually passed away. And uh, I said, you know, while I'm still young enough, I've got a practice to fall back on. I'm going to take a run at professional golf. And uh, that's what got me really into what I'm doing today around the world that I'm more known for is, is uh, really studying grip. And I saw that there was a lot of problems in grip in sports. And how I found that is I traveled with professional golfers for three years. Um, before that point, John, I had treated a lot of different athletes, hockey, golf, tennis, a lot of grip sports. And I saw a lot of elbow and carpal tunnel and wrist problems. 
And I saw that not many people had a clue about golf, or excuse me, had a clue about grip, including the people that had grip products on the market. They just didn't understand the mechanics. When I got into golf, even though I didn't make that PGA Tour, John, um, we've got many Canadians that did, even some friends that I know that played on the PGA Tour. Um, I didn't, I, I wasn't really a good enough player to make it that way, but I saw the inside workings of repetitive grip sport like golf, and it really taught me about everything. Now, PGA Golf is just about, for all those people watching us that are not familiar with golf, it's just about to the very highest level that you can get in golf. And is a lot of money involved, and uh, in people that are at that level can make a lot of money. PGA, what does it stand for again? Uh, professional golf association so yeah so john the pga tour is as big as it gets that's where the best players in the world are um that's where the most money is available uh as far as tournament prize uh, purses go it's also where the most exposure is so you'd see the you know the biggest uh endorsements from companies on their golfers and stuff but golf's an golf's interesting on its own that way is that it's almost like having, I would say, like having a rock band. You, you, uh, you struggle and you struggle and you struggle. And if you make it big, you make it really big. Uh, and, and, but most, it's very difficult. Uh, very few people make it to the top. Um, and the people that do, I certainly have a lot of respect for the, the male PGA players and the female LPGA players are the best of the best in a really difficult pursuit. But, uh, my benefit was that I got to see mini tour players, like smaller tour players. We actually have a Canadian tour as well, um, which is a very difficult tour to make it onto as well. But again, that's a stepping stone for the PGA Tour. But to follow the PGA, these professional players around that made it and didn't make it, you learn a lot about the, uh, the physical training involved in grip and, and keeping a grip strong and balanced. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Terry, that uh, was there not some controversy about uh, the PGA or the golfing uh, or organizations that Saudi Arabia uh, got involved in it? Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> John, that's the most recent. It's a, it's a, it's enormous controversy. Very dividing, actually, amongst golfers is that. The PGA Tour was really the only game in town at the highest level. And, uh, yeah, the Live Golf Tour, which is, uh, I, I don't know a lot about it, to be, able, to be honest with you, but uh, it's, it's Saudi-backed dollars. I know Greg Norman was kind of the, uh, the uh, front-runner name for it. I, I believe he's like the commissioner or the, you know, the manager of the tour. I'm not too sure how they do it. And they, they really did go out and recruit. Uh, actively recruit PGA Tour players and, uh, you know, took a lot of what they did. Uh, they basically had a little bit different format. Um, uh, PGA Tour was always had little criticisms. There was always you had to be formal. It had to be long pants. And the Live Tour, it's a little more casual. It's in shorts. Uh, it's, it's a three-day event instead of four-day events, which it is on the PGA Tour. There's an enormous amount of money. Um, that they paid the players just to come across, especially the, you know, the, the higher it's kind of docking players. And it caused a lot of controversy. Uh, and a lot of people saw that as a way, a lot of the players saw it as a way to really solidify their future financially, certainly, but it comes with the controversy of, uh, of the Saudi money backing it. So there's, there's a lot of details. I know that they're, there's, I believe they're in the process of bringing the tours together and there's a lot of controversy about that. I think that's you see, I at. always kind of thought about, uh, I'm, I'm not a golfer, and I always kind of watch this from the outside, and uh, PGA to me, uh, I like watching it, if they, especially that, uh, you know, the, those major, major tournaments, and oh. it's amazing what they can do, and, uh, and, and those top players that for a period of time will remain on the top, and then usually other ones come along, and, uh, and then I never quite could understand why did the Saudis get involved, because it is not something that complements that so much, because, uh, but I always thought North America in particular is very, very much into golf. Europe, Western Europe in particular, is as well, and 
some of the other countries, but not Saudi Arabia. And I never quite could understand as to why would they, other than it is for money or, or their name, or showing the Saudis taking leader positions in a major sport like that. Yeah, yeah I, think, uh, I, I think there's a lot of, uh, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of opinion on why the Saudis got in. I think golf's always been seen as a really elite sport, first of all. Right. So one of the things I'm not crazy about is how golf is perceived. It's a, it's a yeah. fantastic game. Uh, it really teaches new players and especially kids. It teaches them, you know, you got to be consistent. You got to learn. You got to work hard. You got to be patient right. to get to get really good at it. But it's always been seen, I think, as a little bit of an elitist sport at the highest level. A lot of private country clubs, a lot of money involved in uh, in some of the higher level clubs. But I think also they, you know, some of the things they talk about as far as the live tour is exposing the game of golf to a greater audience and and people are you know have opinions about whether that's really the way why they did it but that's the one benefit i think i see is that it's going to expose a great game to a vast amount of people um and, and i think it's around the world like there's an asian tour there's obviously been a european tour for a long time there the, the golf golf is becoming a worldwide game where in my opinion and it's one of my interesting studies is I, I really, yeah, I, I love the game of golf for what it can teach people, uh, especially, you know, as young kids about perseverance, uh, about um, stick to about learning, about, you know, gaining lessons. The, there's no better game, in my opinion, than that, because you're by yourself. There's nowhere to hide. It's not like hockey or, you know, football or baseball. Uh, your learning is up to you it's right in front of you and uh you become very humble but also very dedicated if you want to if you want to advance in golf and I, I i love that i wish more people would play yeah so a little bit off topic in a way is that here in prince george we have one of the top, top north american golfers but he plays golf and he was on my podcast single-handedly he lost one arm and then became a golfer. I, okay, interesting, because I am also from a hometown that has a one-arm golfer that is uh, world-class as well. We have, we talked earlier, we have, you know, junior hockey teams that are very good, but there's a fellow named Jesse Florkowski. I don't get to talk about yeah, Jesse very often. Yeah, he's from... And, and he talked about that, and I give, we'll, we'll give you the name from the fellow here in Pittsburgh. Yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to meet who he is. Uh, yeah. Jesse's and, a wonderful player. Like a, what, and and he player. referred to him, Jesse, and he's in, in Alberta, Grand Prairie or someplace. He's in and, Medicine uh, Hat, actually. Yep. In Medicine Hat, yeah. So, uh, and, that's, but, that's so I had him on my podcast. I will give you the podcast number. Uh, yeah, you know, before the, our show is over and, uh, you know, but it was amazing to see, you know, some of the things that he said, the technique, hand strength and all of that are very, very major. And it's also part of golf that is becoming more and more worldwide. So yep. he was going to certainly all through North America and uh, in BC. And in and, and Europe, where the, uh, I think he was going to Barcelona or someplace, you know, so. I but, know that uh, Jesse was, we follow Jesse quite closely. <laughs> um, I know that Jesse, they were just, they, I know they did a, they did a, a big production. I should, I should get to know more about it, but I, I do believe it was on a major uh, network, but they've been, they've been doing the, I know they, they've had the, I'm not sure exactly how they phrase it, but, but he goes to these amputee or one arm or these golf tournaments and they played uh you know they played pinehurst number two in north carolina one of the best golf courses in the world and they're playing they're playing great tracks and the exposure is fantastic yeah and i know i know jesse's family i know jesse a little bit but um he's also i mean he's a phenomenal athlete he's like a like a very advanced bowler uh you know a competitive college golfer when he played um, what these guys are doing with one arm is is really hard to believe. But it's again, I 
it's one of those things where it inspires me because I think the game is, if the game is taken for what it is, uh, it teaches you perseverance. It gives you an opportunity to prove what you think you can do. And you talk about these gentlemen that are out there shooting crazy numbers that nobody would even understand under these conditions of one arm, but that's the condition they know and they persevere and, and, uh, they don't create limits for themselves. And I think, I think uh, a lot of people put themselves in a little, put boundaries around themselves and exactly. see some of these people persevere and, and are very successful in those, what we perceive to be a handicap situation. I don't even perceive that anymore. No. It's, it's and, magical. And, and this podcast that I did, it's probably a month ago. Scott will give it to me with the name and the podcast number. But, uh, you know, the fellow was just absolutely amazing. And then and the, the other part is that he lost his arm, but he lost more than that. He lost his shoulder as well. And so, and uh, he was on my podcast and sharing his experience, which were quite amazing. And then finding golf, and all of a sudden, but he was conscientious about, and he spoke about it very openly, but he was yep. conscientious always about the loss of his arm. He kind of wanted to sit in such a way that it didn't put the, all the focus on that, those kind of things. But, yep. and, and then he sh sh showed with our guest that, uh, you know, he was quite conscientious about it, and, uh, uh, you know, but then when he had the opportunity to go into golf and to become a very, very good golfer among other people that were similar to him, that, was, that still is today his world, you know, and, and I, we found that to be absolutely amazing. I, I, I love the story. I, I mean, I, I, I very much want to see that episode. Uh, I know we've We've uh, worked with Jesse, and even what we're talking about, the product we developed, uh, we got one to Jesse that, so that he can keep, because, you know, there's one arm, you're gripping with one arm, and we want to make sure he keep, keeps strong and balanced and doesn't develop a bunch of uh, repetitive grip injuries. And I, I love the story of, I, I, I didn't know there was another Canadian, to be honest with you, that that was, yeah. was that high up, but I love hearing it. And uh, Yeah, let me just check with Scott. Can you give that to me, Scott? I'm, huh? Randy Marcus. I'll write it down as well, guys. Yeah, and that was uh, 193. So that was not all that long ago that we did it. Amazing, you know. So anyway, so what I found amazing about that, because it's all about that one arm, and, and I knew, you know, from talking to him in particular, that it's about that strength, that, uh, that, that grip, and, and how the grip is, and the, position of the body, all those things in combination, obviously your specialty in, in, in many other areas as well is, uh, you know, that uh, was very, very interesting to learn and to listen to because it's so immensely important for success. You know, it's, uh, I find it to be a fascinating story on a couple of fronts because uh, mechanically, you're still trying to accomplish some, like the same things with the golf club. And uh, you're still trying to get a golf club to release to a target. And uh, I can see how it can work, but I can see how it would take a lot to control the club. And right. but again, I've seen Jesse swing lots of times. I'll have to look at Randy, but uh, the way he swings at that club releases beautifully. And, and they just... yeah. So it's what it's what sports it's what it's what a passion is all about. It's to take you to places you know you can go, and then you got to prove that you can get there and eliminate all your negative, all the negative about it, and and, uh, and just make it your own. So the business now that you are in, uh, Cherry, tell us a little bit about that. You got most of your training in BC, I presume, and uh, and and then started building a career. Uh, you know, looking at potentially golf, and obviously you are very good in all a number of other sports, hockey, and all the other things that you were doing, and then looked at had potentially uh, golf as a career, PGA, uh, you know, and then 
decided to, at some point to say, no, I'm going to go a different direction, especially with your, uh, you know, with your background in, uh, uh, how did you call that again? You, your... I was, a, I was, I was actually trained as a chiropractor. I did a lot of sports chiropractic, uh, basic right. sports chiropractic. It was about 50, 50 treating athletes, but always uh, having a family practice mostly. Um, but treating a lot of athletes just because of my relationships and my and my background around uh, right. around my community. So the business that you have now, then that that is based in the United States but is worldwide, what would be the focus there? Yeah. So um, even just through your introduction, what I did is I actually went to school in Iowa. Uh, okay. John, so that's where I took my chiropractic uh, uh, education. Uh, I went to school in Iowa when I played on the golf team there. Uh, and, and a lot of interesting things happened to me that got me really cued off to begin with about, about grip. I'd always grown up in hockey and golf and basketball to take something and, and uh, uh, squeeze kind of a squeeze only item like a tennis ball or a spring loaded or coiled gripper. I grew up that way, didn't question a thing. And then as you get into school, um, there was, you know, then we study anatomy and, and we do dissection lab. And, and I, I always loved those things. I couldn't believe how well built these bodies of ours are and how intricate they are. And I always noticed that there was just as many muscles on the front of the hand that are closing the hand as there are muscles on the back of the hand and the wrist and the forearm and the elbow. It always was in the back of my mind, why are we only squeezing this? Like when we train our biceps, we're going to train our triceps. When we train our chest, we're going to train our back, right. et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't until it was about, I think, my second last year of chiropractic school, we were going on, we did a trip to Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, one of our golf trips. And my uh, x ray professor wanted me to do a project for him to make sure I was doing some work while I was on this trip. It was a week trip. And he got me to compare tennis elbow, which is kind of a, a tendonitis on the outside of the elbow, and compare it to golfer's elbow, which is a tendonitis on the medial or inside of the elbow. So is this and, the back of the elbow? Yeah. So if, I, if, I, if you can see my arm all right, if this is right. my, the, the inside of my elbow would be kind of the the flexing or gripping side, and that's right. what they would equate to a uh, golfer's elbow or medial epicondylitis. And if you right. look at the outside, that would be a lateral epicondylitis or a tennis elbow. And he wanted right. me to kind of compare and contrast. And I had textbooks with me, and I basically regurgitated what the textbook said. But to be honest with you, John, it always stuck in my mind why aren't we looking at the finger extensor muscles? Because those finger extensor muscles are two of the five muscles that attach at that lateral epicondyle. So there's okay. wrist extensors, which is mostly what people think tennis elbow is. Right. But there's also two major finger extensors. And your finger extensors are very active in grip sports. Whenever I grip something, I'm going to try to show you this. Whenever I grip something by, by squeezing, my extensor muscles are actually gripping just as much. And so my theory, even though I didn't say it on that particular report, because I just regurgitated the textbook, at that time I said, why are people not training finger extensor muscles? Because they right. contract and they contract statically every time I grip it. And golfers are always gripping. Um, but so are tennis players, et cetera. So are dentists, right. dental right. hygienists, et cetera, et cetera. But that was my first curiosity is when I first started asking questions. And then when I got into practice before I went on tour, I started uh, treating people that had carpal tunnel syndrome or tennis elbow or medial epicondylitis or all those things by training all of the muscles, the closing and opening muscles of the hand. And I started to see fantastic results. And I, I said, I think I'm right, um, even though there really wasn't any um, there wasn't any research that proved me right until later on we started doing some uh, a lot of emg surface emg and, and showing how active those finger extensor muscles are on grip i don't no, want to get I, too tick but so, sorry all I, I so you basically have yeah you basically have john you have nine muscles that close the hand right they attach the fingers thumb hand wrist carpal tunnel whoops 
forearm, all the way to the elbow. So okay. those nine muscles are really diverse in their attachments. But you also have nine muscles on the back of your hand, the fingers, thumb, hand, wrist, carpal tunnel, forearm, and elbow that open the hand. And all 18 muscles, depending on, your, on what your grip activity are, all 18 muscles are active when you grip something. Right. So technically, if we take something and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze, we are actually shortening an already shortened muscle group. Because as we squeeze, we rarely do anything. When you and I pick up our suitcase, we never pick it with our, on the back of our hand. We always, no. we're, we're always yeah. gripping. Exactly. And so we're always shortening the, the nine muscles that close the hand. So we're always shortening the thumb, the finger. Yeah. The carpal yeah. tunnel is always collapsing. We're shortening the, the elbow. So to take something when we're training and, and uh, train those muscles more actually doesn't make a lot of sense. It's like, it's like telling somebody with bad posture to slouch more. It, it, it just doesn't, there's no mechanical thing. But nobody's really ever seemed to be in a position where they focus on those hand muscles and the related uh, repetitive grip injuries. And I just happened to be one where I understood golf, I understood the muscles, right. I'm able to say, hey, something's wrong here. So if I, and I saw it in your bio there that you're saying 18 muscles and you just explained the nine and the nine. Now, where are they? There are nine on this side. So where are they? Are they the individual fingers? There are two to each finger or? Yeah, so when you look at, Finger, well, it, it gets, it might get boring. I hope it doesn't get too boring. No, I, love I like stuff. it. I no, yeah, yeah. because very, I, very important. Yeah, your your finger muscle, your finger flexor muscles. If I ever can get this, my camera. Yeah, yeah, here. I see it. Can you yeah, see my mine? finger flexor yeah. muscles? The bellies of the muscles, the the actual bellies of the long, the main finger flexors. The belly is actually attaches in your. The belly is actually in the forearm, and it attaches to your medial epicondyle. That's okay. The bone right on the inside of your elbow which is actually a, a, a part of the bone of the humerus of the upper arm right so there's a muscle belly and then you're going to have tendons that go through you have tendons that go deep and superficial to all four fingers okay so you actually have and those tendons go through the carpal tunnel that we all hear so much about uh, so you've got eight finger flexor tendons that are coming through that small tunnel okay and then the long tendons you'll be able to see them You'll be able to see tendons when I grip. Yeah. And they'll go into a muscle belly in, in, that attaches into the medial epicondyle. Those okay. are the main finger flexors. But you also have a thumb flexor muscle. Right. And you have a finger flexor muscle that are small muscles intrinsic into the hand. Okay. So the muscles that control gripping are both intrinsic in the fingers, thumb, hand, wrist, carpal tunnel, and also in, uh, extrinsic in that they go all the way down to the forearm and elbow. Right. So the reason I say that, John, is to be clear to your, to your listeners, is that when people think about, if people say, well, I've got a tennis elbow, most people, and I will even say even health and fitness people, don't equate that to grip. They equate right. that to wrist, something to do with the wrist. Right. But I will tell you, those finger flexor muscles and the finger extensor muscles, the balance between those 18 muscles is very, very important in both of, in everything to do with the, not only the elbow, but obviously the fingers and the thumbs, and obviously the wrist and the carpal tunnel is a really big deal because whenever you read about carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, people say, we don't really know what causes it, but I can tell you, we work with it all the time. And as you train all the muscles through a full natural range of motion, you see carpal tunnel syndrome problems going away you see the nerves start to function properly and you see a stable carpal tunnel rather than it collapsing so amazing it's, it's a really misunderstood area so i'm uh, i'm also an author uh, as, as you may have seen i've Absolutely. done three books and i'm working on a fourth one and i'm just going to show you a picture i don't know if you can see it or not is this the camera that i am on i can see it yeah, living yep. young, dying Very old, nice. and and nice. the, the, and then that is me. Uh, I'm a competitive bodybuilder. I'm uh, at eighty three. I think I'm the oldest competitive bodybuilder in North America, and and I'm training awesome. again now. 
Uh, I competed uh, 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 bodybuilding and physique here in Northern BC in 1917, 1918. I became, uh, I uh, was allowed to compete pro provincially, came in third in bodybuilding, second in physique, which qualified me for the Nationals and the Arnolds. Fantastic. And, and then COVID came and now I'm again training for, at, uh, uh, it's now 2024, to probably in 25 again compete uh, you know, nationally and at the Arnold's and uh, Arnold already told me he's waiting for me and he said, yeah, we'll train together and uh, take pictures together. So the interesting part about it is, and as you can see, I'm, uh, uh, you know, considering uh, at my age, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing quite well and I go to the gym and the point that I was really going to make and, and the whole idea is living young, dying old. But it's important to me in particular is that it's not about age. It is quality yeah, of cool. life. That's what it is about. And, and, so, and, and so the other interesting part about it is that I, I read a, a, a book or an article about uh, a doc that uh, was referring to, he had seen a study where they did 100,000 uh, biopsy of people that died and none of them died because of old age. And then I saw another article, and this comes to what you were saying, is that how can we be, you know, I'm very much into diet. I'm probably 80, 20. My wife is vegan. And then I'm into fitness and health, uh, you know, and, and bodybuilding is just, uh, makes me go to the gym and, uh, and, and, and I'm writing the book and saying, how can I keep this simple? And I saw somewhere recently that there are three things in particular where you can see somebody's health and, and long, potential long levity in a very general way. Good hand strength and grip is one of them. Yep. And, and then there are two other ones in, in terms of, I forget now what the other ones were, but in particular, and, uh, you know, they are fairly obvious. And uh, the hand strength in particular, I thought that, that is very, very interesting because what I do this morning, I was at the gym and I do uh, that, working at that park. I always work with the trainer. So what we were doing is, is stepping up and, and with weights that you carry in the one hand uh, and started out with uh, 20 pounds, 40 pounds, 50 pounds, do it 10 times, 10 times, then the other one. And the other part that I do is hanging uh, from hanging on to the bars and, and, you know, and, and so, and, and trying to do that as long as you can possibly do it. And, and as part of, going to the gym and keeping your body in good shape. Boy, I've got a lot of thoughts on, on everything you said. And first of all, uh, congratulations. I think uh, one of the things that we hear a lot in health, and uh, you know, being a chiropractor, you're sometimes you, you don't really have any urge to comply with a norm, unless it makes sense to you. Yeah. When I hear somebody say, well, I've got this problem, and it's just age related. There's so many times where I just look at that and I say, that's completely silly, even though that's what you've been told. But in the lifestyles that we've supported, I think a lot of people don't know any better. Exactly. Uh, you know, this is many things. I could talk endlessly about the hands and especially about we see a lot of, uh, a lot of like the retired generation playing pickleball nowadays. And they're saying, well, I have a lot of problems with my carpal tunnel and my elbow, but that's just getting old. And I say to them, let me talk to you about the structure that you're dealing with. And it's repetitive gripping. So I want you to be doing this and training your body yeah. in this way. So you prevent the carpal tunnel from collapsing. You prevent your elbows for, from getting static and imbalanced. And all of a sudden you see them turn around and now age isn't a factor anymore. What exactly. they've been told. It's just we have a lack of education and a lack of solid proof of application. It is what you, it is, right? So a, that type a, of an approach. Yeah, and, and it's, these are the types of things I'm trying to change the beliefs of. It's exactly, exactly what you're saying, John. 
The other thing I would say right off the bat is, and if you've seen the studies, there's half a dozen enormous studies that talk about uh, grip strength directly correlated with life longevity. And I'll give you a background on that too, John, that would interest you is that <clears throat> when we started this and uh, I started training people uh, to, to exercise their hands, just like any other joint. If you've been in the gym, you know that joints need to go through their full natural range of motion. Exactly. If they don't, you know, the body's built to be in balance. And if you exactly. support it that way, it functions properly and stays stable. So as we started to bring people through their full natural range of motion with grip, and there's, there's even one more step I'll tell you eventually about how we train grip because the forearm muscles, excuse me, the forearm muscles are very much involved as well. So we talk they about are on, are they on the side or? Yeah, if I was to train you, John, in grip, I would also, I'd have you take our product, you'd close against the ball that we have. Yeah. You'd open and spread against the cord. But then you'd also do a figure eight with your wrist because the wrist and forearm muscles need to also be trained through their full natural range of motion. Right. So, so that's one of the things we're looking at is that when we first started training people that way, John, we started getting feedback that, wow, my, my elbow's feeling better, my hands, my wrists, my carpal tunnel is feeling better, but I'm also sleeping better. I'm yeah. also, uh, I've, I'm feeling less stress and all this. And I always thought like, well, why is that? Um, I thought because they have less pain, less imbalance, maybe that helps them. But we started to see, uh, and it was through, um, it was through a naturopath where I saw his research in the UK. He talked about changing lymph drainage. He talked about stimulating lymph drainage. And I realized that as we're taking, if I'm training the hands through their full range of motion, not only am I, am I going to strengthen and balance uh, the muscles of the hands, uh, but I'm also going to bring blood flow all the way to the extremity. When I bring blood flow to the extremities, I'm also going to increase lymph drainage to the ext extremities. So I'm going to increase circulation. Whenever I do that, the lymph ducts that, that actually drain lymph uh, so, are... So, but our lymph, uh, but our lymph, lymph there. So your lymph vessels are basically, your lymph vessels have a lot to do with it, um, what I would say, almost like a sewage system of your cardiovascular system. They get rid of smaller waste. Um, they're also involved in immunity, of course, with, with, with lymph nodes, but they're, they're involved in clearing smaller waste. Uh, Where would they be with, in the body? So your lymph, your lymph system goes throughout your body, okay. but your lymph ducts are going to drain, uh, they're going to drain your entire body in back okay. into the venous flow to clear, to clear, uh, again, the smaller waste products like uh, byproducts from muscle contraction etc um and byproducts even just toxins we've got enough toxins in our world and in our you know all over the place so we want to keep circulating properly and when i looked at specifically why i thought people were feeling better and i saw this was a dr Perrin. i saw his work on lymph drainage and how he was getting really difficult health situations to react well I realized I think that's what we're doing. We're also increasing peripheral blood flow and increasing lymph drainage in the body. That's my belief. Again, this is not tested, but we've done tests that we've shown thermography wise how we stimulate so much more uh, improved blood flow than like the old traditional taking something and squeezing it. Right. So my assumption is we're also increasing uh, lymph drainage. It's a long explanation, but it, it basically shows that the more active you are the more we move our body it's that old adage if if you know move it or lose it but also uh, the motion is the lotion in the body and and uh if you're not moving as you get older that same thing people don't move as much they're not like yourself going to the gym if you don't move your body has no reason to keep the places that aren't being used efficient and they will shut down and slow down and and then you'll get old right yeah but but your your habits are old if your habits get old you're going to get old but if you stay balanced you stay strength you stay moving through full range of motion you're not getting old it's you're you're going to stay vital until you know 
until an old, old age. And that's the way I want to stay in my life. So, so what I do is that, uh, you know, we, I, I, uh, am, I have businesses here in northern British Columbia. And I, I live in Prince George during the week. And then we have uh, a place in North Saanich, uh, a beautiful place, right? Uh, are you familiar with North Saanich on the yes, Vancouver yes, Island? Yeah, and so we have a place at the highest point and look directly to Mount Baker and look all over the water. And then we have also a 50-acre farm and uh, both my wife and myself, we write English dressage. And, and uh, so my wife is, as I said earlier, she is vegan. I'm probably 80, 20. And, and uh, she is very proactive in her diet, very conscientious uh, uh, of what she eats and what she does and 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 uh, and and doing she has a trainer as well she's working with and uh, and then the other interesting part is that uh, on the weekends when I go on Friday afternoon I go down there and then go back to Prince George Monday uh, uh, afternoons I come back to Prince George and uh, you know but I do all the shopping for her and and so th that's something a routine that we have developed for a long time she doesn't tell me what she wants i i pretty well know so if i go to a grocery store i usually look at the outside of the grocery store because i'm not yeah. interested in all the the foods that are being prepared yeah. in the center so i just on the outside you know and uh, and and then the other part that i say and that's really uh, you know about the book is that I say you don't necessarily have to go do what I do, go to uh, the gym and, and become a bodybuilder and all. I simply do that because of it gets me to the gym and I enjoy it doing like that. But stay at least active. Even if you only stay active for half an hour a day, at least it will keep you mobile. But the other things that I believe are so, that's why your program is so interesting, is the parts with your hands, stay active with them because they are a very, very important part. And it really got my attention when I did my uh, interview with the one-arm uh, golfer. And, uh, and, then, and then the other one, when I saw uh, an article that said there's three points in particular, hand grip strength, uh, you know, it kind of already determines quality of life and, and long levity and, and yep. having that strength. And to exercise your hands is, as you showed it, is uh, important. And to see that having 18, nine on the one side, and nine uh, muscles at the other side, it's, hands are so critically important. And, and so what I was doing in the gym is that uh, I like to do chin-ups. And, and in order to do that, I need good hand strengths that allow me to kind of get to the point of uh, doing chin-ups. Chin but it does really a couple of things. It, it, it forces me to work on my hand strength and my arm strength. Uh, and, uh, you know, so as part of it. The one thing I'd give you advice on is, uh, or, or just a, a tip on, John, that as you're, as you're going there and you're right, it, so doing chin-ups, first of all, fantastic exercise, obviously. Uh, great upper body, lat workout, great exercise, but you have to be careful because in the long term, so we deal with a lot of CrossFit um, athletes. We, we deal with, with a lot of uh, bodybuilders. And if I'm taking a bar and I'm squeezing a bar, your hand strength, and I'm doing that as a hand strength exercise alone, you're still using those nine muscles that close the hand right. are going to be the most powerful. Now, the muscles that open the hand are still contracting back here. Exactly. But they're contracting statically. Obviously, if you're holding on to a bar to do a chin-up and you went like this, you'd be, you'd be on your butt. You know? Exactly. You'd fall down. Yeah. That's one thing I would just... Um, just a little contribution I would do is you make sure we're not asking you not to do chin-ups, no. but that's a repetitive gripping activity. So yeah. you have to make sure that you, if you do that all the time, it's just like the professional golfers that I worked with for years, you're going to develop shortened, shortened muscles at your medial 
right. at the medial uh, elbow, you're going to develop static muscles at the lateral elbow. Right. So we'll we'll get you we'll get you some of our product because then you can you take your hand and you close, open and spread and make sure you offset the repetitive gripping. So you've got right. to keep those 18 muscles balanced. If this is all you're doing during the day, or a lot of people do kettlebells, stuff right. like that, barbells, uh, you're going to run into the same problem that I ran into with all the repetitive grip athletes. So and what do you do on the, the muscles, the nine on the back? This one so is... You know, if you, if you want me to, I, I've got a product here. I can pop yeah, it yeah. onto you and show it to you because it's very simple. Yeah. But everything you and I have talked about with just closing the hand. Can and you show it to me? Or, uh, yeah. I'm sorry? Have you got it close by? Oh, I've got one right here. Um, okay. We, we'll do demos sometimes yeah. on the show. So it's, it's a really simpy, simple, almost, I'll say almost toyish looking product. But the people that yeah. use it and know of it, they know, they know it's, a quite a, yeah. it's quite a difficult exercise. So I'm, all I do is I'm going to slip it on the thumb. And it's just, it's just resistant elastic band that goes in your thumb and your fingers this quickly. And the same thing that we just did, um, I'm just going to do it with the ball. So now the ball simply resists me closing. So I close yes. against the ball, then I open and spread against the cord. So I close so now against you're, the ball. Now you're working the, the nine now, muscles you, on the back. Exactly. Yeah. So when I open and spread, you can see I'm training through a full range of motion. We I used to it. use elastic bands to do this. But if I use an elastic band, I can only open so far. And, and exactly. we, you would know we want to take the hand through its full natural, all muscles through their full natural range of motion. Exactly. So when I use this, I can close against the ball and I can open and spread against the cord. I don't have to tell the the user three or four exercises they just simply close open and spread and they train all 18 muscles through their full range of motion but also john what we do if we're training athletes like such as yourself if there's somebody that does a lot of gripping golfers or we do a lot of workplace ergonomic stuff we would have them close open and spread and then we'd have them do a figure eight with their wrist while their hands open so close open spread figure eight, because there's also nine muscles in your forearm that position your wrist in whatever grip activity you're doing. Exactly. So there's 27 muscles of grip that with that simple exercise, we can have them train it, uh, train all 27 muscles through full range of motion uh, in one continuous exercise. And I don't have to show them, you know, the five or six exercises I used to show them in practice and they would get pretty bored on it. Yeah. When I treated professional golfers, they wouldn't do all the exercises that I would show them. They just don't have time. I was playing golf at the time too. I didn't have time to explain it. And when we developed hand master plus, that's one thing I was kind of thinking, how am I going to get to teach these people properly? And I just three o'clock in the morning, this idea comes to you and then you just go, if I put this cord through a ball, um, I can train all those muscles from a proper resistance. And the can golfers, you, yeah. Can you put this one on both hands? Or you have to have- Yeah, both hands, hands, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it'll, have, it'll have proper finger sizes for each hand as well. So you just turn it around one side, turn it around the other side. So it's left and right, but very easy to use. So. If you're an athlete or you're a musician or you're in a workplace, you can train this very easily and stay strong and balanced. How many routines would you suggest? So if I got that I, and I want to get this, if I'll, I had I'll, it, yeah. how many would I have to do? So we always recommend to our users that they would use it one to three times a day. Yeah. Uh, people ask how many repetitions they would do. We say you go until a comfortable fatigue. And, and John, when you start with this, I want to kind of come back to what we were talking about, about life longevity. There is, we want to stimulate as much circulation as possible in our body. That's what keeps us, you know, it gets us nutrition, it gets us oxygen, but it takes away toxins and it keeps us really efficient and it keeps our, our uh, internal cardiovascular system very efficient. 
Well, there's nine muscles that we've never ever trained until we develop this. So now we're training exactly. those nine, the nine muscles to close, the nine muscles open, and nine muscles that are in the forearm. Yeah. When you feel this, John, the first time you do this figure eight exercise, you won't even believe it because none of these muscles have probably been trained through their no. full range of motion. No. So not only do we strengthen and balance the grip, the blood flow and the, the amount of circulation change that you'll see is, uh, is pretty remarkable to new users. I find it amazing. So I want to buy one of those. We'll, uh, when we're done this podcast, we'll send you, we'll send you some. You, you, we've got a bodybuilder that's in his 80s. We'll send you one. And I want you to feel it. You'll also, we also want, we also, this is the biggest change that we can make in people, John, requires education because most people still think this is gripping. Yeah. So when we can talk to people that Including do education me. like yourself, uh, we want you to understand how important it is to change our thoughts about the hand muscles, right. about the grip muscles. They're very poorly understood. Um, this is something whoever's watching the podcast this is something whoever has you know everybody should have this and everybody should be getting blood flow to their periphery and strengthening and balancing their hands there's so many applications uh so no we want the people that are educating health and fitness to understand this exercise uh because small only a small portion of the population does have you got a website uh, uh cherry that people can Maybe share it with us. Uh, yeah, they can the go world. to, for this product, they can go to handmasterplus.com and they can learn all about it. We have lots of video links uh, there. And for our, our main business is doczac.com. It's D-O-C-Z-A-C.com. And there's also a link to Handmaster Plus in, in the doczac.com website. Um, that, that's, our, that's our business. And, 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 and so that's a company that is working internationally with people in those particular areas like uh, hand strength for one and, 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 you know, and the products that you use for that. Yeah, John, the way that the, way that the Handmaster product itself worked, like when we first started, you know that I was involved in athletics. So we thought right. we're going to help a lot of athletes. Then we started helping athletes and then we started helping musicians. And then we started helping musicians and we started looking in the workplace. Um, there's a lot of repetitive gripping in the workplace, then yeah. in computers, then in gaming. And we've just grown and grown and we're still growing because we're educating people to do hand and grip training properly so they don't, they don't run into these repetitive grip problems. Um, so we're as busy as we want to be and we continue to grow uh, because there's so many markets that uh, are grip dependent. Um, that we have a lot of these educational uh, sessions to do with with many different markets. So from a now I'm an entrepreneur, and and so when you developed it, did you get a patent on it, or how did you protect it? Yeah, yeah, we we have uh, <clears throat> we have a patent on the product as well as a trademark on the product, um, and and now we have. Oh, uh, as far as therapy distributors, so we've a very good relationship with, oh, probably 50 to 60 therapy distributors around the world. Uh, so uh, through that, I think, you know, um, IP protection is a really strong thing, but I think the relationships is your strongest thing. Um, right. I think you need them both. I think it's, uh, as we were developing, we got a lot of advice on um, making sure we had our patent protection but but also um the stronger relationships we have and the work that we do with with our customers and we we we've worked a lot to educate people on how to do this so we have uh we have very loyal uh partners as well and uh it just is it's a it's a fun business um it's a rewarding business because we get to even yourself we get to speak with athletes uh we get to speak with gamers and musicians and people i never thought i'd meet and we get to tell them something that to me is basic and to me now that we have handmaster plus it's really easy to solve too so once i can educate them i can also give them a solution that 
is so easy to do. They don't have to memorize five or six exercises. Like when I was in practice, I used to show people way too many exercises and then they, and they would have a hard time remembering them. And, and that is normal, right? So if I think about this, uh, you know, like what you're doing is that it's not only for issues relating to longevity, uh, you know, living young, dying, uh, uh, or living young, dying old. It is not only for that particular purpose, but also if you are, as you said, uh, initially a golfer, but then further beyond that, uh, somebody that is on computers, somebody is a musician, it applies to all of those and, and people that had never even, like myself, I think I'm reasonably well informed, but I never thought of myself as that I have 18 muscles that are critical, all working together. It's not just this, it is well beyond that, including making the aids and uh, I just look forward to your uh, yeah, I think when you get <clears throat> John, I think when you when you feel it in person, you'll be blown away. And we've had that experience for, you know, a decade now of watching people when they first do the exercise and their eyes just light up. But but I think that's you probably encapsulated. That's one of the things is that very few people and I always wondered like why did somebody not see this before I saw it? And I just got into a circumstance where what I always loved was sports. And I, what I, when I studied it, um, <clears throat> I saw that a little bit, I was a little bit cynical that, well, why are we not training the muscles that open? But it wasn't, I wasn't really ready to act on it until you see professional golfers day in, day out. And I was on mini tours, so you're traveling in cars. Um, you're traveling sometimes 8, 9, 10, 15 hours. And, and people have, you know, a lot of these players have families at home that are depending on them. And when they have an elbow problem or something like that, you just feel for it's them. And so there was, there was an urgency and I got to see so many repetitive grip injuries. So I was almost placed with the education and then placed with the trust of the golfers and, and, and uh, the exposure to all these injuries to where I don't think with my background that I couldn't not see it. Whereas maybe and, and somebody... And that's the difference between you and other people that know part of it, but they do yeah. not have your educational background. They don't right. have the experience as being, uh, you know, uh, a near professional golfer and then being exposed to all of those and then asking the question as to why are we doing what we are doing and then finding a way that you woke up in the middle of the night and said, bingo, that's it. Because what you had to do, you had to find something that is simple, not complicated. Right. Thumb goes here, fingers go there and start doing your thing. You can do it right away, put it at the other hand, do it three times a day until it feels close to becoming uncomfortable and then you do yep. more of that and uh, and then it becomes routine you can do it while you're watching tv or whatever you're doing and 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 then all of a sudden you see the results as a user and uh, yep. but uh, you found something that a you were educated you were in the sports you had exposure to all the injuries and then the light went on you found something that is simple and that is simple, that is the key to this particular approach, in my opinion. Yep, you, 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 you encapsulate that well, it really is. And it's, it, it's almost the perfect storm that I think I was perfectly set up to find. And then um, it still takes the people, like I say, even we go on these podcasts, I meet people like yourself. Uh, there's so many people that I could name that I've met that I never in a million years would have met them, but they're they're good points to now, if I'm able to share the message in a fairly simple way, now how you just encapsulated that, John, you can explain it to other people that it can, that can be helped. And it's just, it's kind of what I see this, this as being what I enjoy so much is that um, it, once it is simple, you, it, can be, it can be taught to people that can teach it to others. And, and, and it, it makes sense to people almost instantaneously. And, and, and the other part that will happen is me, when this book is coming out next July, 
and uh, you know, and we we nearly done with it. And one of the things that will be in there is a number of things that uh, you know that uh, the quality of life and that uh, you know the uh, and I maybe already said it, but uh, I read something uh, that this doc said that uh, he read this article about somebody that a hundred thousand bio. Uh, um, and bios of people that died, biopsies of people that had yep. died, not a single one of them died of old age. Nope. And, and, and so, and then the book, the ob objective of the book is trying to keep things simple and to the point. And certainly your approach to it will become part of my book in terms of hand strength, but it is, goes further than that, is how can you create it in such a way that it becomes an, a habit that is simple, very straightforward, and if you do it well, you will feel the results very, very quickly. And that's the approach to good health and, 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 and at the same time, going to the gym and doing your, all the things there well or keeping your body active in a general sense, keeping it not necessarily going as far as I do, unless you like to, but, but you have to, we have this precious, given this body that is so immensely forgiving, but then it goes to a certain point and then it says, <laughs> I can't take any more abuse. And, and uh, you know, and then the other part about it, uh, Terry, is that uh, at 83 now, uh, I enjoy what I'm doing. I, uh, and I, I want to show you something here that uh, and at some point we'll have another podcast and we'll talk a little bit more about my books. I wrote three books. The one is Against All Odds, and it's about all the ups and downs that go all through the different stages. The other book that I wrote is that uh, I was not very good academically. I failed grade three and I failed grade seven three times. Yes. Yeah. I felt that I had been a failure and then found uh, that one day, one day I went into a bookstore here in Prince George, actually I opened a book, Driven to Distraction, and what it said is ADHD, and I said, oh my God, that's me. And, and the more I found out about it, uh, the more I realized that it's not a liability, it is no. a superpower. And I wrote a book about that, uh, ADHD oh, Unlocked. Very good. And then I wrote another one about that. So many people don't like what they are doing. And, and I say change. And then young people, uh, you know, I, I, I do a lot of presentations to them and they don't know. I say, so uh, what are you going to do for a career? And they say, well, I don't know. I say, well, you know, it doesn't really matter. What you should do is find out what people do. If you want to be a welder, talk to people that are welders. If you want to be an accountant, talk to accountants. If you want to be a doc, talk to docs. And if you want to be a lawyer, talk to them or entrepreneurs for that matter. And then kind of focus your thoughts on maybe that's the area of interest. And then that's where I wrote the book, Finding Your Passion, Living the Dream. And I'm, I'm signing, going to sign these copies for you and I'm going to send oh. them to you. And, and wow. then the, the other part about it is that I always kind of felt I had been a failure, even in Holland. And I dreamed of going to Canada because we were liberated by the Canadians, mm -hmm. April the 12th, 1945. And, and, and so I came to Canada and I wanted to start with nothing. And, and I wanted to build a lumber mill when I came here. And so uh, my employees gave me this and I, I had $25.47 in my pocket. I had one suitcase, couldn't speak the language, didn't know a soul, didn't have a job. And, uh, you know, so, and, uh, you know, the, uh, and, and then between finding that I ADHD, that kind of changed a lot of things for me. The more I found out about it, the more I found that they thought that about 8% of the population are affected by ADHD. Not only me, but many other people feel it's closer to 20%, if not more. And it's a superpower. Mm -hmm. For successful entrepreneurs, I would think that it's probably as high as 40% of them being ADHD. I would agree. 
I would agree. <laughs> you know, and, and I love it. But so I say ADHD Unlocked is also for people that are slow learners and, and uh, or people that have been affected by trauma. And, uh, you know, so uh, anyway, I, I recommend that people read not only my book, but other books about that. And then obviously now I'm doing the other one, living young, dying old, and, uh, you know, so, and taking a different approach to health and hormones and all the other things that are new and different from our traditional uh, medicine and, and just getting pills for all the things that you think, but try to yeah. go to the core and try to fix the problems rather than taking medication to, uh, yeah. to, to hide it or... Yeah, you know, John, it's, it's interesting what you say, because uh, first of all, I love what you're doing. Like, I, I love, I could see your passion, but that's the big thing is you, you have to live an exciting life and, and people um, just often don't go towards excitement. And, and uh, I think we, we have to, but uh, you said earlier that, uh, you know, we've been given this blessing of a body that, that can do so many things we, and we're, we're designed to do so many things, but um, we're just told a, a little bit of a fib about, uh, you know, what we're supposed to be and what we could do. And, and, uh, I think entrepreneurs, I, we deal with entrepreneurs and I speak on podcasts with entrepreneurs all the time. And it's like, the only thing that's limiting you is sometimes what you've been taught. Um, and I'm yeah. not saying, you know, you need to learn for sure, but often we're yeah. taught to be in a little box and, and, uh, that little box could be one of the most harmful things that we do and that we ever, exactly. we were ever involved with. Um, exactly. So you take your good learnings, but you you certainly have to um, you certainly have to follow some intuition, which, which uh, we've often been told is is not to be followed. And and um, it, I know I know your history a little bit, John, and uh, you're a person that I think a lot of kids should listen to and and not be put into a little box. Exactly. And then the other part, Terry, uh, what I say here is that uh, you know we living in this beautiful country canada or actually in north america and then especially looking around the world uh, you know how fortunate we are and uh, and how fragile it all is and do not take for granted that uh, things tomorrow be the same it's so important to preserve this democratic system rather yep. than being in uh, uh, you know the ukraine and russia and and now in the Middle East, uh, you know, that uh, war is, is uh, you know, a lot of people have the idea about war, this war, and then when the war is over, everything goes back to normal. That's not how it goes. It goes for sometimes a generation, sometimes two generations before things come back to a sense of normality. Even for myself, born during the early part of the, the Second World War, uh, I was affected by PTSD and the inner child or the fear of losing the one parent that protected us and uh, do not, do not take it for granted. And, uh, uh, you know, and I believe that is very, very important and, and bless every day that we are here in this beautiful, beautiful land. Yeah, well, I think we also have to work really hard to, you know, we talked about today to show the truth of how the hand muscles and the grip muscles work. but we need to continue to show the truth of what um, health and fitness is. And, and uh, sometimes those truths have been hidden from us for, for reasons that I think are a bit nefarious. And exactly. I think the people that we're starting to get a bigger and bigger wave of, of um, professionals that are starting to speak about, hey, our body works best this way and that way. And most of them are very natural and available ways. And like exactly. I say, they've got to be actionable. Like, you know, we put out a product now that, that the world is accepting very well, especially when they're educated about it. That's very actionable. But going to the gym is very actionable if you plan it. Um, exercising, exactly. movement, walking, um, diet, having a pet. There's just so many actionable things that can that exactly. will really help your health. And I exactly. think I think we've got to stay really speaking of things that are actionable and and get away from this. You know, your health is from the outside in. Your health is from the inside out. Exactly. We, we have to understand how important it is and, and be, um, take, take individual control of our, of our lives. And that's, that's the democracy and that's freedom to me. Yeah, I agree, Terry. This was an amazing discussion. 
tell us once more your websites for those that want to follow you or get information. Yeah, so our, our main website is docsac.com. They can go to doczac.com um, <clears throat> or they can go directly to Handmaster Plus uh, or they can just, again, search who our partners are and where they can get a hold online or in stores. Um, and if anybody ever has questions, uh, John, that you're any of your audience, they can get a hold of me at info at docsac.com and I will answer all the technical questions for sure. They all come to me. Thank you very much, uh, Terry. It uh, was an amazing uh, uh, podcast and, and very informative. And uh, uh, I will sign the books, get them out to you tomorrow. And uh, then and at the same time, uh, the podcast will be available uh, within 24 hours. And uh, for your uh, uh, guests that are watching your podcast as well. All right. Well, thanks for having me, John. I really enjoyed meeting you and uh, really glad we got this together. That's, uh, it was a thrill to meet you. Okay. And we'll stay in touch. Absolutely. I'll get some product out to you as well. Okay. Thanks, Terry. Take care. Take care now, John. Bye-bye. See you.